I'm happy to bring up an old friend of Stevens who will be introducing him. So that's uh, Laurent uh, Basselar. So Laurent, please. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. And yes, I am an old friend. I am. And it's, uh, that's one of the treasures that we get with age as we become old friends. Because during the last 25 years, I've often been happily busy reading, learning from, listening to, and also teaching Stephen Dunn's poetry. I have at numerous occasions had long conversations mostly lovely, about his work. And I've noticed similarities in how students and friends react to his work. How is he able to write poem after poem without leaning on much metaphorical imagery? How can he be so often brilliantly hypothetical? Or, although his poetry has its narrative and lyrical moments, he's a thinker, a poet of reflexivity, of personal and political conscience. Or, and I quote the poet Kurt Brown here, Dunn proceeds by rigorously refusing to adopt any emotion or position that has not been dispassionately examined. All this, of course, is very true impressively smart, and for some, delightfully heady and scholarly. And I nod and opine, even quoting some of his lines, to appear as informed and together as my interlocutors. But what I listen for always, and hear a lot, is Stephen Dunn's constant, unerring, unfailing tenderness about the world, about our fallible human condition and our clumsy attempts to be holy and love as much as we can. And because of my good, ripe old age, Henry, I feel I can now say aloud what I have kept for myself all these years. Stephen Dunn, is one of the very, very, very few poets I really trust. Last week, he sent me his new chapbook, Keeper of Limits, the Mrs. Cavendish poems. I had a lot to do when it arrived in the mail, but you know how it is when a friend sends you a book, you open it, you want to see your name in his handwriting on the page, and you flutter the pages and read here and there. Well, I made the mistake of reading just the two first sentences of Mrs. Cavendish poems. She moved into his name willingly for reasons phonetically, for reasons phonetically, and she especially liked that Cavendish had a ring of entitlement to it among bankers and brokers in the New Jersey suburbs where they moved to escape her friends and join his. And that did it. My lots of things to do were out the window, and my you-know-what immediately followed by me and the Mrs. Cavendish poems were in the couch. You're in for a treat, and I hope Stephen will share some of those witty, moving, and very tender Mrs. Cavendish poems. Ladies and gentlemen, the poet Stephen Dunn. Hello. Thank you, Laurent. Uh, I, I asked her to do this because I knew she'd do something like that. Uh, and it, it, it was lovely. Uh, thank you, Henry and Annie, for having me and for all of you being here. I want to start with a different chapbook that I did. Uh, I, I, my, the only poems I've ever published. Pardon me? How's that? Uh, yes. Is that better? Yes. Uh, these, these are the only poems that I've published independently, paid, that is, paid for them myself. I found myself with about 18 or 20 short poems that seemed like they wanted to hang around together. 
So I'm going to start by reading you one sh very short one, and then do some other things. Then read some some of the Mrs. Cavendish poems. This this would be the inaugural reading of that book. But this is giving birth. At my favorite professor's dinner party years ago, I gave birth to what I thought was a new idea, and the room got quiet with tolerance. I still hear that tolerance. Propositions. This is an epigraph from Randall Jarrell. What does a pig know about bacon? <laughs> Propositions. Anyone who begins the sentence with, in all honesty, is about to tell a lie. <laughs> Anyone who says, this is how I feel, had better love form more than disclosure. Same for anyone who thinks he thinks well because he had a thought. <laughs> if you say you're ugly to an ugly person, no credit for honesty, which must always be a discovery, an act that qualifies as an achievement. If you persist, you're just a cruel <laughs> bastard, a pig without a mirror, someone who hasn't examined himself enough. A hesitation hints at an attempt to be honest, suggests that difficulty is present. A good sentence needs a clause or two, interruption set off by commas, evidence of a slowing down, a rethinking. Before I asked my wife to marry me, I told her I'd never be fully honest. No one, she said, had ever said anything like that to her. I was trying, I said, to be radically honest, but in fact I had another motive. A claim without a but in it is at best only half true. In all honesty, I was asking in advance to be forgiven. If a clown, if a clown came out of the woods, a standard looking clown with oversized polka dot clothes, floppy shoes, a red bulbous nose, and you saw him on the edge of your property, there'd be nothing funny about that, would there? <laughs> a bear might be preferable, especially if black and berry driven. And as this clown began waving his hands with those big white gloves that clowns wear, and you realized he wanted your attention, had something apparently urgent to tell you, would you pivot and run from him as, or stay put, as my friend did, who seemed to understand here was a clown who didn't know where he was, a clown without a context. What could be sadder, my friend thought, than a clown in need of a context? If then the clown said to you that he was on his way to a kid's birthday party, his car had broken down and he needed a ride, would you give him one? Or would the connection between the comic and the appalling as it pertains to clowns be suddenly so clear that you'd be paralyzed by it? And if you were the clown and my friends hesitated as he did, would you make a sad face and with an enormous finger wipe away an imaginary tear. How far would you trust your art? I can tell you it worked. Most of the guests had gone when my friend and the clown drove up and the family was angry. But the clown twisted a balloon into the shape of a bird and gave it to the kid who smiled, letting it rise to the ceiling. If you were the kid, the birthday boy, what from then on would be your relationship with disappointment, with joy? Whom would you blame or extol? It's called, this, this poem is called, Don't Do That. It was bring your own if you wanted anything hard, so I brought Johnny Walker Red along with some resentment I'd held in for a few weeks, <laughs> which was not helped by the sight of little nameless things pierced with toothpicks on the tables, or by talk that promised to be nothing if not small. But I consented to come, and I knew in what part of the house their animals would be sequestered, whose company I loved. What else can I say except that old retainer of slights and wrongs, that bad boy I hadn't quite outgrown, I brought him along too. 
I was out to cultivate a mood. My host greeted me, but did not ask about my soul, which is when I was invited by Johnny Walker Red to find the right kind of glass and pour. I toasted the air. I said hello to the wall and walked past a group of women dressed to be seen, undressing them one by one, and went up the stairs to where the Rottweilers were, Rosie and Tom, and got down with them on all fours. They licked the face I offered them. I proceeded to slick my hair back with their saliva. Before long, I felt like a wild thing, ready to mess up the party, scarf the hors d'oeuvres. But the dog said, no, don't do that, calm down. After a while, they open the door and let you out. They pet your head. Everything you might have held against them is gone. And you're good friends again. Stay, they said. <laughs> I think I saw on the advertisement for this reading uh, a poem uh, called Sea Level, which I'm now going to read to you. Sea Level. Down from the mountains of Appalachia and the highs of new love, I've come across the extended monotonies of interstates back to where scrub pines stand small at sea level. There's the house I left for good, if forever can ever be good. And there's the great Egg Harbor River, which widens here. And everywhere, the visages of ghosts appear and disappear. I've come to visit the friends who stayed casualties chorus, the dearest ones who somehow have learned to live amid the messiness of allegiances and turns and half turns of whom now to console, whom to embrace and when. I pull into their driveway wanting to tell them how it feels to have for the first time an undivided heart, a sudden purity of motive. But when I begin to speak, I realize I don't. I say it anyway, we won't take it back. When the outside cat wants in, they let him in. Then he wants out, they accommodate. The cat is almost as lucky as I. No mountains here, I can see the afternoon sun on the horizon, hanging on, about to dip and be gone. Their yard is a dusty orange. I love the truth. I swear I do. Mm. Now I'm going, to try, I'm going to try to introduce these Cavendish poems. They, they're the most curious poems I've ever written. They won't seem that way to you. They'll seem like poem poems, I think. But uh, I started by writing uh, about a Mrs. Cavendish whom I don't know and had no idea who she might be. And I didn't know who was speaking to her either. But uh, this gave me kind of maximum permission to do whatever I wanted for a while. And then of course you have to know what you're doing or it's just gonna be silly. Uh, and at a certain point, I had somewhat of a handle on her and him. I'm just going to read you a couple of them, give you a taste of it. It turned out that, that if you write enough of anything, it, or at least if, I'm not sure that mind is always shapely, as Ginsburg maintained, uh, but mind got shapely. Uh, the, the poem started to cohere, they became a kind of novel in verse, I suppose. Here's the first poem in the, in, in the book. Rachel becomes Mrs. Cavendish. She moved into his name willingly for reasons phonetically and otherwise obvious. She especially liked the Cav that Cavendish had a ring of entitlement to it among bankers in, in New Jersey, in New Jersey suburbs where they moved to escape her, her friends and join his. She was young and had a sense of what could be called waspy fun. She had never met anyone like him. Both of them kept me off balance in those days. When I'd visit, I'd find myself half beguiled, half annoyed by how she'd tell lies about things we'd experienced together. But what could I do? She was in the act of becoming Mrs. Cavendish. I knew from then on I'd keep her past in the same closed up closet 
where I kept my own dark secrets. In that way, her husband and I became keepers of her preferred memories. He knew I loved her, but thought of me as an adoring remnant, essentially prehistoric. The truth is always different from what anyone says out loud, but who really cares? Not I, said the man I chose to be, nor I, nor I, nor I. Among the many of us, she left teetering. And this is actually the first poem I wrote in the Cavendish series, which is now on page 11, uh, the way those things work out. This is Cavendish in the End of Secrecy. Morning and the moon still out, a fuzzy moodiness over the land as the sea struggles with that old magnetism from above. Mrs. Cavendish, the sea doesn't want to be bothered today. It merely wishes to behave like a lake, settle back, reflect back a face like its own, sometimes wild, mostly calm. It also would like to ch change its salty ways, but like you, Mrs. Cavendish, it can't. The world is various, but also cruel. I tell you, Mrs. Cavendish, you should buy a big flat screen TV and engage the world in the safe way most of us do. When the census man comes with his charts and those categories he'll want you to check, remember to lie about your age. Tell him you're not happy about the end of secrecy. You don't want to become a stat. At another time, the sea too will want to undulate and roar, not be lake-like at all. Mrs. Cavendish, there's so much women peculiarity to accommodate. I wish I could tell you the best stroke to use if you choose to swim where the orcas rule. <coughs> all I know is that you shouldn't answer if a man without a heart asks about yours. He'll have plans, he'll have strange eyes in the front of his head. They'll be for you. And when the moon, and the moon will recede, cannot help, will only serve as witness as the cosmos does. Mrs. Cavendish and the General Malays. Like a boxer at a pre-fight weigh-in, defiant, no sign of acceptance, Mrs. Cavendish began to stare meaninglessness in the eye. The difference, no one, nothing stared back. Mrs. Cavendish, I said, it's impossible to win. As we consider today, it's almost tomorrow. As we admire the flowers, how easily they're ravaged by wind and rain. The best we can hope for is a big fat novel slowing down the course of time. Several tomorrows always linger in the margins, which means until the very last page, you'll choose to live with the raw evidence of how someone else makes and sees a world. Mrs. Cavendish, I'm also sorry to report the maps are missing from the office of how to get where you want to go. Just one more symptom of the general malaise. I have little hope that they can be found, at least not in our lifetime. At the risk of telling you what you already know, Mrs. Cavendish, here's something merely true. The sufficiency of the moon has been replaced by the lantern, the lantern by the light bulb, but what won't, but, but, but what won't go away is the promise of salvation out there and the bright beyond. There'll always be people who think suffering leads to enlightenment, who place themselves on the verge of what's about to break or go dangerously wrong. Let's resist them in their thinking, you and I. Let's not rush toward that thing that awaits us, which can dumb us into nonsense and pain. My dog keeps one eye open when he sleeps. My cat prefers your house where the mice are. Stare ahead, my friend. The whole world is on alert. This is Cavendish. Every day is old news. I have, I'm going to read uh, 
probably an unfortunate amount of dog poems tonight. Uh, this is, I'm going to skip a couple of things I was going to read. I'm going to read to you Mrs. Cavendish's dog who speaks from the grave, as dogs do, of course. Mrs. Cavendish's dog. I'm a dead dog for real now. No longer can I rise from my fakery, alert to commands I've come to think of as love. Though I never did obey as well as sundown did, or as a truly good dog would. To play the slave, not be one, was my code. You understood who would play the master. From my grave in the yard, Mrs. Cavendish, I see now you had no gift for it or heart. Bad dog, you'd say so little conviction in your voice. In seconds, you'd be patting my head. Forgiveness made you happy. I tip over trash cans to be forgiven by you. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's no life being dead. I'd give anything to chase the gulls again. But clarity's come when the body goes. For whatever it's worth, you should know, you who think so much, only what's been smelled or felt gets remembered. And in the dark earth, no door is open. No one ever comes home. I don't know if any of you have a time of day when you're most likely to get in trouble. Mine's around. Mine's around four o'clock in the afternoon, so most of you are safe here. Uh, you will see what I mean shortly. Bad. My wife is working in her room writing, and I've come in three times with idle chatter, some not new, new news. The fourth time she identifies me as what I am, a man lost in late afternoon in the terrible in-between. Good work long over, a good drink not yet what the clock has okayed. Her mood a little bemused, leave me the hell alone, mixed with a weary smile, and I see my face up on the post office wall among men least wanted, <laughs> looking forlorn. In the small print under my name, annoying to loved ones in the afternoons, lacks inner resources. I go away guilty as charged and write this poem which I insist she read at drinking time. She's reading it now. It seems she's pleased, but when she speaks, it's about charm and how predictable I am. How when in trouble, I try to become irresistible like one of those Blonde dogs with a red bandana around his neck. Sorry, he's peed on the rug. <laughs> Forget it, she says. This stuff is old. It won't work anymore. And I hear, good boy, good boy. <laughs> and can't stop licking her hands. The imagined. If the imagined woman makes the real woman seem bare-boned, hardly existent, lacking in gracefulness and intellect and pulchritude, and if you come to realize the imagined woman can only satisfy your imagination, whereas the real woman with all her limitations can often make you feel good, how in spite of knowing this does the imagined woman keep getting into your bedroom and joining you at dinner, why is it you always bring her along on vacations when the real woman is shopping or figuring the best way to the museum? And if the real woman has an imagined man, as she must, someone probably with her at this very moment, in fact, doing and saying everything she's ever wanted, would you want to know that he slips into her life every day from a secret doorway she's made for him, that he's present even when you're eating your omelet at breakfast? <laughs> Or do you prefer how she goes about the house as she does, as if there were just the two of you? Isn't her silence finally loving and yours not entirely self-serving? Hasn't the time come once again 
not to talk about it. That's, that's when I, I, I remember when I first started to read it, the first, all the women would be frowning at me in the first half of the poem, and they get very happy when I give them a, <laughs> an imagined man, and it, it seems to balance itself out. Here's a love poem to my wife, Barbara. Here and now. There are words I've had to save myself from, like my Lord and blessed mother, words I said and never meant, though I admit a part of me misses the ornamental stateliness of high mass, that smell of incense. Heaven did exist, I discovered, but was reciprocal and momentary, like lust felt at exactly the same time. Two mortals say on a resilient bed, making a small case for themselves. You and I became the words I'd say before I'd lay me down to sleep, and again when I'd wake. Wishful words, no belief in them yet. It seemed you'd been put on earth to distract me from what was doctrinal and dry. Electricity may start things, but if they're to last, I've come to understand a steady low voltage hum of affection and the difficulty of turning a page. Well, affection must be arrived at. How else to offset the occasional slide into neglect and ill temper? I learned in time to let heaven go its mythy way, to never again be a supplicant to any single idea. For you and me, it's here and now from here on in. Nothing can save us, nor do we wish to be saved. Let night come with its austere grandeur, ancient superstitions and fears. It can do us no harm. We'll put some music on, open the curtains, let things darken as they will. It's called Talk to God. Thank him for your little house on the periphery, this its splendid view of wildflowers in summer, and the nervous fork prints of deer in that same field after a snowstorm. Thank him even for the monotony that drives us to make and destroy and dissect what otherwise would be merely the lush, unnamed world. Ease into your misgivings. Ask him if in his weakness he was ever responsible for a pettiness, some weather, say, brought in to show who's boss when no one seemed sufficiently moved by a sunset or the shape of an egg. Ask him if when he gave us desire, he'd underestimated its power. And when, if ever, did he realize love is not inspired by obedience? Be respectful when you confess to him you began to redefine heaven as you discovered certain pleasures. And sympathize with how, it, how sad it is that awe has been replaced by small enthusiasms that you're aware of things just aren't the same these days, that you wish for him a few evenings surrounded by the old stunned silence. Maybe it would be possible then to ask why this sorry state of affairs? Why, after so much hatefulness done in his name, no list of corrections nailed to some rectory door? Remember to thank him for the silkworm, apples in season, photosynthesis, the northern lights and be sincere. But let it be known you're willing to suffer only in proportion to your errors, not one unfair moment more. Insist on this as if it could be granted, not one unfair moment more. Mm -hmm. I was at a writer's colony at Yaddo a couple of summers ago with a poet named Spencer Reese, good poet, uh, who, was write, who was writing a long poem about Hartford, Connecticut, where he grew up. It was about his mother and about Wallace Stevens, of course, where Stevens spent most of his life. And in reading it, I was aware of something that he didn't know about Stevens, 
uh, that I knew and knew would screw up his poem a little bit if I told him it. Uh, and I told him it. And, <laughs> and it screwed it up happily, I think. And he thought so too. Uh, but it was, uh, I, oh, I, this is an important detail I have to not leave out. He was leaving the next day to be ordained as an Anglican priest. And the line from Stevens, I believe it's from one of his essays, is that the poet never yields to the priest. And it turned out after our discussion that night, this, this became, I think, the most ecumenical poem I've ever, I've ever tried or written. If the poet, if the poet doesn't yield to the priest, as Stephen says he shouldn't, and if both reside in the same village and call on their powers to rectify or explain the latest disaster, does the priest become less persuasive because his ideas are likely not his own? And is the poet suspect for the same reason? Would a good priest find the right words as the good poet would in among the many words passed down for centuries on what to think, what to believe? Or would reverence always get in the way of the true, thus possibly giving the poet the edge? That is, if the poet mis mistrusts words as he should, makes them pass hard tests, though they must be arranged and shaped in order to convey even a smidgen of truth, wouldn't he, although self-ordained, be more reliable? But what if the villagers believed they were saved by a prayer, the priest said one Sunday morning among the ruins, and all the poet could do was elegize the ruins? Would the real and the imagined fuse become something entirely new? And what if the poet and priest were one, each invoking the other as the crops grew and rain was steady in rainy season, or just as confusing things got worse and prayers proved useless, and poems merely decorated the, the debris where a house once was. Would it be time for the priest to admit he'd known but one book, for the poet to say, say he'd read many and look, it hasn't helped? Or has the issue from the start been a great need that can't be fully met, only made bearable and sometimes served by those who try? When I was coming here, I was thinking, I had to pay some homage to Charles Olson. And I, I was looking through my books to see if I had any. And I, I have something that's something like, like that. It's, it's an epigraph from a book that I hope to find here. I wrote a book called Riffs and Reciprocities, maybe it came out in 96, I think. And it was a collection of, of prose paragraphs, some people call them prose poems, which was fine by me, uh, that were tangentially related. And I was, uh, I was trying to say things uh, in sentences that I had never heard anybody write before. That's a dangerous thing to say when you're going to read. You, you will say, well, I know that one. Uh, but I had come across in one of Olson's essays uh, this line, poems should be more like essays and essays should be more like poems. And that's the epigraph to that book. I'll read you a couple. I used to have such a, uh, a commitment to the doubleness, to the tangential quality of these that uh, I would never read one separately. Now I don't care. <laughs> so I'll read you a few. This is Scapegoat, if I can find it. Scapegoat. It's the Day of Atonement, and Aaron has a brilliant idea. Two goats as offerings to the Lord. 
One he kills as a personal atonement for himself and his house. The other is the scapegoat. He lays both hands on his head, confessing the sins of the people, then sends it off into the wilderness. Poor goats, lucky unburdened people. It's easy to see why such an idea caught on. There's a burnt offering too involving a ram. In the face of the ineffable, Aaron tries to cover all bases. But we're mostly interested in the goat that bears our large and small mistakes and carries them away from us. Leviticus knew how to tell a story, but here's what was never reported. The Lord saw the goat in the wilderness stumbling, half dead. He said to it, a goat's life is an awful thing. This was not my intention. What they've done to you is just one more of their sins. I'll read one, one more of these little guys. Uh, one of the ongoing, fairly benign arguments I had with my ex-wife that we, uh, was her contention that crows always traveled in threes. Uh, no amount of empirical evidence would dissuade her of this fact. Seriousness. Driving the Garden State Parkway to New York, I pointed out two crows to a woman who believed crows always travel in threes, and later just one crow eating the carcass of a squirrel. The others are nearby, she said, hidden in trees. She was sure. Now and then she'd say, see, and this clear dark trinity of crows would be standing on the grass. I told her she was wrong to under or overestimate crows and wondered out loud if three crows together made any evolutionary sense. I was almost getting serious now. Near Forked River, we saw five. There's three, she said, and two others with a friend in a tree. I looked to see if she was smiling. She wasn't, or she was. Men like you, she said, need it written down, notarized, and signed. <laughs> after Jack and Jill at home together after their fall, the bucket spilled her knees badly scraped, and Jack with not even an aspirin for what's broken. We can see the arduous evenings ahead of them, and the need now to pay a boy to fetch the water. Our mistake was trying to do something together, Jill sighs. Jack says, if you'd let go for once, you wouldn't have come tumbling after. He's in a wheelchair, but she's still an item for the rest of their existence confined to a little rhyming story. We tell it to our children who laugh, already accustomed to disaster. We like to teach them the secrets of knowing how to go too far. But Jack is banging with his soup spoon. Jill is pulling out her hair. Out of decency, we turn away, as if it were possible to escape the drift of our lives, the fundamental business of making do with what's been left us. History. It's like this, the king marries a commoner and the populace cheers. She doesn't even know how to curtsy, but he loves her manners in bed. Why doesn't he do what his father did, the king's mother wonders. Those peasant girls brought in through that secret entrance, that's how a kingdom works best. But marriage, the king's mother won't come out of her room and a strange democracy radiates throughout the land, which causes widespread dreaming, a general hopefulness. This is, of course, how people get hurt, how history gets its ziggy shape. The king locks his wife in the tower because she's begun to ride her horse far into the woods. 
How unqueenly to come back to the castle like that, so sweaty and flushed. The only answer his mother decides is stricter rules. No whispering in the corridors, no gaiety in the fields. The king announces his wife is very tired and has decided to lie down and issues an edict that all things yours are once again his. This is the kind of law that history loves, that contains its own demise. The villagers conspire for years, waiting for the right time, which never arrives. There's only that one person, not exactly brave, but too unhappy to be reasonable, who crosses the moat, scales the wall. Some years ago, uh, Joseph Campbell, the famous mythologist, for lack of a better term, came to my college to read and talk. It was a Saturday, he spent all day doing it. He was quite marvelous. And told this story, which I appropriated for this poem. In, in his Jungian way, he, he was claiming that uh, anybody who hadn't found their essential face by 35 was in big trouble. Uh, and he told this little story about a tiger. Tiger face. Because you can be what you're not for only so long, one day the tiger cub raised by goats wandered to the lake and saw himself. It was astounding to have a face like that, cat handsome, hornless, and we can imagine he stared a long time, then sipped and pivoted, bemused yet burdened now with choice. The mother goat had nursed him, the others had tolerated his silly quickness and claws. And because once you know who you are, you need not rush, and good parents are a blessing whoever they are. He went back to them, rubbing up against their bony shins, keeping his secret to himself. But after a while, the tiger who'd found his true face felt the disturbing hungers, those desires to get low in the reeds, swish his tail, charge. Because he was a cat, he disappeared without goodbyes. His goat parents relieved such a thing was gone. And we can imagine how alone and beyond choice he wholly became who he was, a zebra or gazelle, stirring the great blood rush and odd calm as he discovered while moving what needed to be done. I'll read three or four more. Hmm, I may do that. One of the pleasures of being here in Gloucester is uh, to have a bunch of my friends with me. We're staying out on East, Eastern Point and uh, they're very dear people and more of them are coming next week. This, Finally, a poem I think about companionship, though it may seem like something else for a while. A postmortem guide for my eulogist in advance. Do not praise me for my exceptional serenity. Can't you see how I've turned away from the large excitements and have accepted all the troubles? Go down to the old cemetery. You'll see there's nothing definitive to be said. The dead once were all kinds, boundary breakers and scallywags, martyrs of the flesh, and so many dumb bunnies of duty, unbearably nice. Mm -hmm. I've been a little of each. And please resist the temptation of speaking about virtue. The seldom tempted are too fond of that word, the small spirited, the unburdened. Know that I've admired in others only the fraught straining to be good. Adam is my man, and Eve's not to blame. He bid, he bid in, it made no sense to stop. 
Still, for accuracy's sake, you might say I often stopped, that I rarely went as far as I dreamed. And since you know my hardships, understand they're a mere bump and setback against history's horror. Remind those seated, perhaps weeping, how obscene it is for some of us to complain. Tell them I had second chances, I knew joy. I was burned by books early and kept sidling up to the flame. Tell them that at the end I had no need for God who'd become just a story I once loved one of many with concealments and late night rescues, high sentence and pomp. The truth is I learned to live without hope as well as I could, almost happily, in the despoiled and radiant now. You who are one of them, say that I love my companions most of all. In all sincerity, say that they provided a better way to be alone. Okay. Sweetness. Just when it has seemed I couldn't bear one more friend waking with a tumor, one more maniac with a perfect reason, often a sweetness has come and changed nothing in the world except the way I stumbled through it, for a while lost in the ignorance of loving someone or something, the world shrunk to mouth size, hand size, and never seeming small. I acknowledge there is no sweetness that doesn't leave a stain, no sweetness that's ever sufficiently sweet. Tonight a friend called to say his lover was killed in a car he was driving. His voice was low and guttural. He repeated what he needed to repeat, and I repeated the one or two words we have for such grief until we were speaking only in tones. Often a sweetness comes as if on loan, stays just long enough to make sense of what it means to be alive, then returns to its dark source. As for me, I don't care where it's been or what bitter road it's traveled to come so far, to taste so good. Read two more. What goes on? <clears throat> after the affair and the moving out, after the destructive, revivifying passion, we watched her life quiet into a new one, her lover more and more on its periphery. She spent many nights alone, happy for the narcosis of the television. When she got cancer, she kept it to herself until she couldn't keep it from anyone. The chemo debilitated and saved her, and one day her ha husband asked her to come back, his wife, who after all had only fallen in love as anyone might who hadn't been in love in a while. And he held her so different now, so thin, her hair just partially grown back. He held her like a new woman and what she felt, felt almost as good as love had. And each of them called it love because precision didn't matter anymore. And we who'd been part of it, often, often rejoicing with one and consoling the other, we who had seen her truly alive and then merely alive, what could we do but revise our phone book, our hearts, offer a little toast to what goes on? I'll finish with this. Uh, some years ago, I was listening to an interview with John Ashbery. And the interviewer asked, asked him something which I thought very strange. How come you don't write more poems about the occult? And he, he, he said, uh, because it's not strange enough. <laughs> which seemed just right.
not the occult. Because I was slow with girls and didn't understand they might like to be touched, my girlfriend took my hand and placed it on her breast. We were 16. I just left it there as if I were memorizing, which in fact I was. It was all research and dreams, some fabulous connection between my hand and her breathing. And I was breathing like that too. I've always been drawn to such ordinary mysteries, women and men, the broken bridge between us. I like thinking about night falling in a house where anything can happen and has. Strangers coming in from their public outposts, the drift of history behind any wish to explain. How to say what can't be said across a table or bed. It's not the occult and the obvious, those obvious stakes in the heart that make me wonder. I confess I have trouble speaking to people fond of outer space. I don't like riddles. I'm tired of ambiguities, old academic hush. Still, things happen, and simply to record them is often to deceive, to even sometimes mimic fog, the way it's perfectly yet inadequately clear about itself. I'm thinking of that woman returning from the restroom, unable to recognize her husband. She wasn't old, he hadn't disappeared, though she perhaps had lost him. Where is my husband, she asked the waiter, who pointed toward the table. I'm thinking of the time we lay ourselves down among the dwarf pines, looked up at the sky. Nothing was new up there, and down here the words for love stuck in their history of abuse. Angel, I wanted to say, meaning darling. It seems heroic how we survive each other, heroic how we try. I'm thinking of the power of loveliness to sadden. Oh, once there was such awe, such a pure desire to praise, there's not one of us who inspires as much. But I love the local and crude, somehow made beautiful, all the traces of how it got that way erased. And I love the corporeal body itself, designed to fail, and the mind, the helpless mind, so often impelled to think about it. Thanks for listening.